Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to the Nice Train Speaker Series. And this morning, we have um, Dr. Jeffrey Sun, who is on the leadership team in the, in the Dean's office as the Associate Dean for Innovation. And he's going to share with you, he's going to bring greetings this morning from the Dean's office. Good morning, Dr. Jeffrey Sun. Good morning, Dr. Stark. So on behalf of the University of Louisville's College of Education and Human Development, welcome to this session featuring Principal Caffelli. Uh, Principal Caffelli, as you know, is a really inspirational and thought-provoking speaker who himself inspired teams um, to bring new leadership in schools and reinforce the essential role of equity in our classrooms. So we're really delighted to have Principal Caffelli here today. Principal Cavalli's talk today is sponsored by the Nystrand Center for Educational Excellence. Uh, the Nystrand Center in, is Kentucky's only center of excellence addressing educational issues, and its mission is to develop, implement, and study collaborative efforts to improve teaching. So to that end, many of you here today have been part of the Nystrand Speaker Series, which has had the important theme of equity, race, and social justice in education and it's a call for action. We at UofL hope that you draw on these ideas, leading them to action and advocacy for social change today. Before I move too far into this session, I wish to introduce to you, Dr. Geneva Stark. She is the director of the Nystrand Center for Educational Excellence. She's also a clinical professor and in our leadership department at the University of Louisville. Dr. Geneva Stark retired from JCPS, Jefferson County Public Schools, after 20, over 25 years of administrative service, Dr. Stark served as a teacher, assistant principal, and then principal at Western High School. Dr. Stark became the first and only African-American to serve as president of Kentucky Association of Secondary School Principals. She later became <coughs> uh, the JCPS Human Resource Department um, staff member and served in a vi variety of roles. She's also served as the Director, Administrator in Diversity, Equity, and Poverty. Now, Dr. Stark is a native of New Orleans. She retired from, as I said, uh, from JCPS, but she's also had many different roles. She is a community member, and most significantly, she's also a friend and colleague here at the University of Louisville. So Dr. Stark. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Sun. And um, I think I need to put you on my... Uh, on my list of uh, people who introduced me. So what a phenomenal job and, and thank you for that. And um, thank you for the work that you do here at the University of Louisville because it takes all of us, a, it's a collective effort and we need all hands on deck. Um, but with that being said, and also we want to thank our Dean, um, Dr. Amy Lingo for the work and for the leadership that she provides, you know, and especially this opportunity to be able to have a speaker series to bring in Principal Cafeli, you know, and other individuals that can talk about the work that needs to be done because it's not about just dialoguing what's gonna be the action plan. And with that being said, I want to introduce Principal Caffelli, one of the most sought after school leadership experts and education speakers in America. Principal Caffelli is impacting America's schools. He has delivered over 2000 conference and program keynotes, professional development workshops, parenting seminars, and student assemblies over his 34 years of public speaking. An expert in the area of attitude transformation. And he will tell you what attitude transformation is in his delivery. Principal Caffelli is the leading authority for providing effective classroom and school leadership strategies towards closing what he coined the attitude gap. And as we know, many times people say, well, What's going on? Well, let's, let's look at access and opportunity and the attitudes that we have as we walk into classrooms and educational institutions. He is the recipient of over 150 educational, professional and community awards, which includes the prestigious Milken National Educator Award, the National Alliance of Black School Educators Hall of Fame Award, induction into the East Orange, New Jersey Hall of Fame as well, because he is a native of New Jersey, and the city of Dickinson, Texas, proclaiming February the 8th, 1998, as Baruti Kafeli today, Baruti Day. And without further ado, again, I'd like to present to you Principal Kafeli and today's 
you know, focus is equity, race, and social justice in education, a call for action. Principal Kafeli, we welcome you. Right, good to be welcome. Thank you, thank you to the two of you. Good to be here. Um, hope my volume is sounding good and strong. I think it is. Yes. Um, good to see everybody out there in, in Zoom land this morning. Um, what's becoming a very new normal. I don't know if I want to complain or not about the new normal. I think, um, you know, I got, you, you won't see it, but I, I, I bring a camera and a light with me everywhere I go, because you just never know when you might set up and start talking to folks about education. And let me say this to you all too. You'll notice that um, the, my name, you know, my name is Baruti Kafele. Baruti means teacher, comes from Botswana in Southern Africa. But um, I don't use it very often. I use principal. And, you know, there's this word that we use, it's called why. We say, what is your why? What is the why to what you do? And I figured out, you know, I, I, back when I was a teacher, I said my why was, was teaching, my why was to be an educator. That why, one's purpose is significant in your practice. Those of you who were students, um, just trying to figure out, well, I, I know I'm studying education. I know I wanna become a teacher, but I always ask, the teacher or the pre-service teacher to take it a little deeper than that. You know, I want to be, I want to teach, I want to make an impact, I want to make a difference. I say, okay, that's that's good, but go deeper. What is your specificity? What's that thing that you said, but while I'm teaching, while I'm within the realm of teaching, there's there's this thing or this, you know, this 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 small amount of of things that I said, these are very specific to who I am. What is that? So see, for me, when I, when I realized I wanted to become a principal and then I did it for a long time, I was walking in my why every day. Now, now it's interesting, let me, let me talk about the why and then we'll, we'll pull up the presentation, although I'm, I'm, I'm on point right now, I'm on topic, but I'm just not using a PowerPoint. Um, I had just posted on my Facebook page less than an hour ago when I was in the parking lot. I said, when I arrived to Canton, Ohio on Sunday, at some point during that day, I was going to speak to the administrators on Monday. A 16 year old was murdered on Sunday. So when I spoke to the district administrators on uh, Monday, the high school principals and the high school principal and assistant principals could not be present because they had to stay in the building for obvious reasons. So that bothered me all day. Then I found out yesterday, the day I arrived in Louisville, another 16 year old was murdered in a drive by shooting. And that has bothered me since I heard about it. And then I went on and posted about it today. The reason it bothers me on the, on the one hand is because it's human life. But on another hand, my why. I entered teaching in 1988 in Brooklyn, New York City for one specific reason only. And it had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with teaching language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. As far as I was concerned, that was secondary. I entered the profession because of those very young men, black boys. I said, I, I reflected back on my own life, my own upbringing and my, my, my mother trying to raise me into a man and, and struggle. She really struggled. Some of that we'll get into later. And I thought about, I've always reflected, what if my father was in my life, in, in, in my home, in my life, holding my hand, walking me through life, helping me to understand the journey toward from, become, from being a boy into becoming a man. What, would that have made a difference? So I decided to become a teacher to be that guy. See, that was my why. I, my why wasn't to make a difference in a, in a very broad and vague sense. My why was very specific. I wanna go in here <laughs> and be that father figure to these boys, when I became a principal, to be that father figure 
to those boys for the 14 years that I was principal. So when I retired from it 10 years ago, early retirement at the age of 50, um, I decided I was going to keep my title. And that's why I use Principal Kefele, because I still want to be that guy that was leading those schools for that very specific reason. So I, I ask you the question now rhetorically, although I want you to feel free to write it right into the chat. What's your why? When I say your why, what's your purpose? What's your reason? What's your because? What's that thing that keeps you tossing and turning at night? What's that thing that dominates your thinking? What's that thing that dominates your conversations with others when maybe they don't even want to talk about it, but that's what you want to talk about because it's your why. What is that thing? And when you become a classroom teacher, speaking to the students again, will you walk in it without being distracted from it? To the faculty, same thing. Is, is there a why that drives the work? Me speaking to you this morning, I'm in my why, not, not, not solely with, with the young men now, but my why in terms of the work I do to, to do my part in helping educators soar to another level, right? So drop your why on me in the chat so I can just see it. I'm not going to spend a lot of my time reading them out loud, but I do see them, but I, but, but I do want to go with Dr. Delena. Alexander to change the trajectory for students who don't see their future as bright. You know, that's that's big time. There's a um, there's a presentation, a workshop that I do, a keynote actually that I do that I've been saying I need to convert into a book, but I haven't done it yet. But it's called Just One Educator Can Completely Alter the Trajectory of a Child. Let me say that again. Just one educator can completely alter the trajectory of a child. But when I say educator, let me be very clear on what I mean by that. I don't mean solely a teacher or an administrator. I could mean a counselor, just one counselor, a social worker, a psychologist, but I don't have to limit it to certificated people. It could be just one cafeteria worker, just one custodian, just one security officer, Right, just one nurse, just one librarian, just one secretary, and on and on. Just one parent. So what I'm saying to you is, youngster can go through through life, and 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 just endure so many different challenges and obstacles, and 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 force youngster to be on this downward spiral. But then they meet this one person. They meet Dr. Alexander, or they meet. Dana, or they meet Pat Marshall, you know, whomever it is, they, they meet you, and, and, and they've been spiraling downward, spiraling downward, and then here's you, bam, and now there's no way to go but up, because there's something about you that said you will be a success story, because we now share the same space. See, Dana said, leave the world better than I found it. Pat said to work with students and teachers to learn together. See, so, so you got to have that why. I bet you there's somebody out there right now. And you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, this guy, Principal Kefele, asked a profound question. What is my why? Because there could be someone out there, I meet them all over the, all over the country, that don't know their why because they've never really given it any thought or they didn't have somebody that broached the top, the conversation, the topic where now they're looking within themselves saying, huh, I never thought about that. I just, I just do what I love. I'm walking in my passion, but I'm saying you got to go further and walk in your purpose. But first you've got to identify your purpose. Now, a lot of people say to me, how do I find my purpose? I say, well, you got to carve out some quiet time in your space. You got to you got you got to disconnect and and, and and detach from everything, and you got to just be you, just just you, thinking about you and 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 what is this inside that I haven't even recognized yet? And if you take that seriously, 
maybe an accountability partner work with you, you might find your why if you're having a tough time finding it. Enough said, let me get into this topic here, even though I'm on it, I'm just not in the presentation mode, but here we go. Um, let me hit that play button. Take a look. It's not enough to do equity. You must be equity. Hmm. Let that marinate for a second. You guys, the faculty's been teaching equity. The students have been learning equity. And, and quite frankly, faculty learning equity as well. You know, we're all we're all life, lifelong learners. And then here comes Principal Kefele on September 23rd saying doing equity, that's the practice of equity, it's not enough. And I mean that with every fiber of my being. Doing equity is not enough. You must be equity. What do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. You know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. I, I pride myself on having been an equitable practitioner for all my years in education, which go back to 1988, when there was no language for equity. Nobody was talking equity back then. When you said the word equity, you were talking about the net worth or net value of a home. We weren't talking about practices in a classroom, but instinctively i saw i looked at the students and they happened to be all black i was in in a, in a black section of brooklyn new york city and although they were all black they were not the same see sometimes we think I'll, I'll hear people say well you know diversity is really not our thing here because we're we're mono, we're racially monolithic and socio, uh, socioeconomically monolithic. And I say, so diversity is not, is not a, a consideration in your school or district? No, we, you know, we, you know, we're all white or we're all Latino or we're all black, whatever it is. I say, but no two students are the same. Like if, 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 if a young man, if, a, if an African-American young man came and sat down next to me right now, we are not the same. We don't look at the world the same way. We don't have the same experiential background. We, we, we don't have the same needs and interests. We, we, we just happen to be black and male and that's probably where the commonality stops. You know, there may be certain things we're interested in. Maybe we both like history. Right, maybe we both like the same sports team. You know, we like the Louisville Cardinals, even though that's not my team. But but also since I'm looking at Dr. Stark with the with the logo behind her. So 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 now, but then after that, there may there, there may not be a whole lot of other commonality. So there's diversity in the room between two people. So I'm saying here. It's the same thing. But if I'm just doing equity, but I'm not being equity. Now, what do I mean by being equity? Being equity is something that really can't be taught. Let me say that again. Being equity is really something that can't be taught. See, someone can teach me how to do equity. But as a rookie teacher, I hadn't been taught how to do equity, quote unquote, do equity. I, I hadn't been taught that, right? I came in education through an alternate route program. I, I was a marketing major in college. So I hadn't learned, I didn't know education at that time. I, they just, I just, they threw me in the classroom and said, hey, make it work, right? Literally. And I couldn't bring the do equity part. I brought the be equity part. I said, these children are all different. And therefore, I have to make sure that I distinguish one youngster from another. I have to make sure that I differentiate one youngster from another. I hadn't been taught that. It's just something instinctively that made sense to me. And that's who I was for my entire career. That's who I continue to be. Now, I'm going, we're going to get deeper into that as I proceed. But again, it's not enough to do equity. 
you must be equity. Critical questions for becoming an equity mindset teacher. We got some students on here today. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say students, if you don't have a Twitter account, let me respectfully invite you into the 21st century. See, it's, 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 all, it's all cool and dandy and fun to have your, your Instagram page, your TikTok account, your, your Facebook page, you know, all that stuff. But as an educator, you got to have a Twitter page. Here's why. The professional development's not on Facebook. And, I mean, it's, it's on, to, on a smaller scale it is. Instagram on a smaller scale it is. Um, TikTok. But Twitter, that's a different ball of wax now. All the professional learning that you will ever need is on Twitter. Folks are posting links and information and videos on Twitter every day, 24-7, holidays included. A, a zillion people, figuratively speaking, I say to them, because because I'm always curious, say, how'd you hear of me? You know what they say, right? Twitter. Twitter. There's a whole lot of educators in America, a whole lot of administrators in America. When I say a whole lot, I'm saying thousands that are in administrative positions because, and I'm not saying this because I'm saying, I'm saying it because they told me. They say, I got these jobs because I watched your videos. If it had I not watched your videos, I would have never gotten hired because I couldn't get hired until I watched your videos on how to get hired or, or how to be an effective assistant principal. I said, well, how'd you find the videos? <laughs> Twitter. See, they're on YouTube, but they found me on Twitter. Twitter's where it's at. So I'm saying to you, get yourself a Twitter page. If you're not one that wants to tweet, don't tweet. If you're one that doesn't want your picture publicly, don't post it. If you're one that doesn't want your, your um, personal information out there, don't put it on there. Just follow other people. That's all. People who are influential, who can, to, who can help you get from point A to point B, right? So, so with that said, I keep seeing that Diana, um, D Delina has a raised hand. Um, it, it, does, she, does she, can she talk? Are we doing it that way? Can she talk to him? Because if so, I'm all ears. Jump on in here if you want to. Dr. Dr. Alexander, were you, were you trying to talk to me? Dr. Alexander, if you'd like to, you, you do have the ability to speak now. Just unmute. No, sir. That, I was the first one in, and I was asking a question of them, and I guess it stayed stuck on oh, that. Oh, okay, okay. All right, no problem. Thank you. So let's go, y'all. Critical questions for becoming an equity mindset teacher, right? Equity mindset teacher. Keep that, that, that uh, language in mind as I proceed. What is meant by classroom equity? Just let that marinate for a hot second. What, what does that mean? And, you know, it's, it's interesting. You all, you know, I'm talking to students, so some of you may know and some of you may not know, but there was a, there's a book, there's, a, there's some research by a researcher, educator by the name of Dr. Carol Dweck. And, and, and she's the one that kind of coined the whole growth mindset, fixed mindset. And, and her work became the go-to in terms of just understanding growth mindset, fixed mindset. So the book Mindset that she wrote, you know, that was, that was sort of like the, 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 the growth mindset Bible for a lot of people. You know, they go back, they make, they, they go back to that book, they reference that book, reference her research and so forth. So there was some universal language. You know, when you heard people talking growth mindset, you know, we kind of, we had commonality of thought because there was this universal language. Equity is different. That go-to book has not been written yet. Um, I guess every author that writes one hopes that their book becomes the one. And obviously I have an equity book that's brand new. And, and, you, and you hope that your book is the one that people kind of refer back to. But, but, but in the interim, that book doesn't exist. So if you're talking, if, 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 if this was a panel, a huge panel of say 25 different scholars, educators, practitioners, et cetera, and, 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 and we started talking about what is equity, you might get 25 different answers. 
because you got so many different perspectives out there. But the commonality, and that's the one I like to dwell on first, the commonality is this, meeting young people where they are. That's, that's the commonality, right? I mean, it's so much more complex than this very simple definition with the four dots after it. But at, it, at its core, at its base, at its foundation is meeting young people where they are. But I like, always like to add to that as they are. See, so not only where they are, but as they are. Because see, to the students that are watching, you're gonna enter a classroom. And some of the students are going to come into that classroom just as you would like them to come. They're gonna come in there very polished. They're gonna come in there very motivated. They're gonna come in there with the right mannerisms, the right behavior, the right focus. They'll be serious about what they're doing. I mean, they, they, they're gonna come in, you're gonna love them. But that's not all who's coming in. The opposite end of the spectrum of youngsters are gonna come in as well. That youngster that may exhibit behaviors that you deem undesirable. That youngster may, who may say things to you or to peers that you may deem to be undesirable. That youngster that doesn't look the way you might want the youngster to look. That youngster that may not perform academically the way you would like that youngster to perform. The youngster that doesn't have the focus that you would like that youngster to have. And I can go on and on. So two, two extremes and then everything or everyone in between is going to walk into that classroom. So, that, so, so those youngsters are going to come into the classroom as they are. Right. So and, and when we talk about equity, you have to be conscious of that. You have to be cognizant of that. That youngsters, that, that you have your task is to meet them there. They're going to come as they are, and therefore you've got to meet them where they are. Right? Because mom, as the cliche goes, is going to send to school her best. That's what she's going to do. So now are you equipped? to meet that youngster where that youngster is. Are you doing your homework beyond what you get in the classroom in the university? See, sometimes you may have to go above and beyond. You may have to go into some, some of the communities in, in Jefferson County, right, in Louisville. You may, you, 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 you may have to immerse yourself into really understanding real life people. You know, one, it, it was interesting. I, I did a Q&A the other night, a couple nights ago in, in Canton, Ohio. And a question arose that always arises. And, and, and it was like, when I saw the young lady walk into the mic, I said, I said to myself, here it comes. And I'm, 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 I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm welcoming it. And I'm ready, right? It was, it was a community conversation on equity. And... It was a diverse audience, racially diverse audience. So they had people coming up to the mic, keep people coming up to the mic and asking me questions. And then a young white woman teacher walked up to the mic and I said, here comes the question, here it comes. And she said, she said, Principal Kefele, as you see, I'm a white woman, but I teach black students. Can I be you in terms of your results? Can I be you as a white woman with black students, which includes black males? I don't know if the organizers of the event would were upset with me or not in the length of my answer. I don't know, I didn't ask. All I knew was they said, come in and speak to the audience and answer questions. And we never talked about what time, how long my answers had to be. I think I spent 45 minutes answering that question, right? So I know we went over time because people started trickling out, right? But, 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 that, but that was fine because for her to ask me that, I wanted to give her a thorough answer. Let me give you the short answer because I'm not going to spend 45 minutes recapping what I said to her. Actually, a lot of it's embedded in this presentation. But my short answer, 
of course you can achieve the results I achieve. Because if I said anything less than that, then I should be discouraging you from being in this field. I can't, see, I can't be practitioner. I can't be presenter. I can't be role model. And I'm telling people because of race, ethnicity, gender, whatever it is, that you can't be successful. I do desire to see a black presence in these classrooms. A black male presence in these classrooms make zero mistake about it. However, that's not all who's going to be there. So if I have, in this case, as I as 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 I as I asked the um the woman questions, it turned out as happens often, her world that she grew up in was not the world that the children grew up in. So I, I tend to use the word bubble. So the children grew up in their bubble. And many of the children, their bubble is very limited. Their bubble is their world. And, and you know, you're, you're, those of you who are students, and, and, and maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't know a lot of the nuances of just being an in, in, in urban inner city youngster in a school, you, you, you will soon discover that you have children in these, in, in these schools where their world is almost confined to the block that they live on. And they have no, they, they have no conceptualization of a world outside of that, or at least a world outside of that, that they have a, a, a place within it, which was something that I attacked ferociously as a teacher and a principal, by the way. Um, you, got, you guys come out to this evening program we're doing and I'll get into that, right? So, so, so here, I said to her, yes, you can be effective, but you've got so much learning to do. You got to learn the history of the community, of those young people, meaning African-American history, but also local history. You got to learn the experience of walking in their shoes. What is that like? You got to learn the experience of their parents. What is that like? You got to learn their world. So in other words, as an educator, we are never ever teachers of content first, never ever. If, you, if you're finding yourself, for example, identifying yourself as an elementary school teacher or as a math teacher, as a science teacher, as a social studies teacher, as a, as a, as a language arts teacher, if, if, if that's how you're identifying yourself, you, you gotta change that. Because when you do that, you're putting content ahead of, ahead of children. You, you, you've got to make sure that, you, that always at the forefront of your mind, I am a teacher of children. Because that changes the whole perspective. See, when you're a teacher of content, then that's the focus. How, how can I deliver this content better, right? But when you're a teacher of children, then that's the focus. How can I connect with the children better? See, so if I can connect with the children better, there's a higher probability that I can now to deliver in part the content to them but if i don't know them but then when we talk about knowing them then here comes the word equity because youngster a youngster b and youngster c are not going to comprehend the same way i could be i mean literally i you know i'm a, I'm a very transparent person and you could go to your local middle school right now. Bring, bring, some sixth, bring some seventh grader in here to sit next to me right here, right? Put on a, a t put, turn a television on or right on the computer and we, we'll watch a segment of a cable news program right now, right? Just one segment between commercials. We'll watch it together. 60 year old me, seasoned educator me, 150 plus award, 12 books, all that stuff, turnaround principal, teacher of the year, We'll, we'll put that youngster next to me. If that youngster is an auditory learner and you give the two of us an assessment on what we saw in that five minute segment, 10 minutes, whatever it was between commercials, I'm gonna tell you right now, that seventh grader is going to outscore me. I'm transparent, y'all. That seventh grader is going to outscore me. Why? 
because I don't learn through my ears on topics that I don't know anything about. Now, I should have pref- I should I should have prefaced it with that. If it's something I'm familiar with, fine, I'll, I'll hold my own. But if it's some new information, new names, new situations, new events, new laws, you know, just new stuff that I can't connect it to anything, I can't learn it. Matter of fact, so so that seventh grader will probably outscore me if that seventh grader is an auditory learner. Did the teacher take into consideration that there are different modalities of learning sitting in that classroom? The equity teacher. The equity mindset teacher understands that. But I got something better for you. I was home on Saturday. So Saturday, uh, after I finished, I do a broad a podcast, a, a, a live stream every Saturday. After I finished, I started reading something. I said, I know I got to get in like three miles of walk, right? Because, you know, I got to stay healthy. So I saw this article. And it was, I I forget who the author was, but the article was called Critical Race Theory. And it was, it it was, it was a story about Derrick Bell, who's considered the the father of critical race theory. And it was a long article. I mean, long. So then it's, but I said, man, I want to, I want to, I want to read this because I know Derrick Bell, but, but, but I don't know him in today's climate. I hope that makes sense to you. So in other words, I've known Derek Bell for a large part of my adult life. He's, you know, he's deceased now, but I've known his work. But I knew him when no one was, 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 was all upset over this thing called critical race theory. So now I said, I wanna, I wanna read this article about him with that knowledge of 2021. You're with me. So now I said, man, I wanna read this, but this thing is long. And then I noticed it said it had a, it had a, a recording. So you can listen to it. It was they had the, the audio um, version of it. You can listen to it while you walk. So I said, okay, good. I'm gonna listen to it while I walk. I'm doing three miles so I, I can get it all in. Watch this, y'all. Hear me. And I think you know where I'm going. I would say after the first 10 minutes of that walk, which would have taken me at least an hour, right at the pace I was going. Dr. Dr. Starks would have done it in half that time, but that's for another, that's for another day, right? So, so (laughs) maybe even a quarter of that time, but, but anyway, so, so now after 10 minutes, I pulled my phone out of my pocket, man, and I hit stop. And I'll listen to something a lot lighter. Here's why. Because I don't know what that reader said. I don't know. I mean, listen, y'all. I have no idea. I'm, I, 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 I'm, you know, I don't, I don't have learning disabilities, y'all, that I know of. I just couldn't learn that. Here's why. Number one, it was to the ear. There's certain things I can learn through my ear. L- let me, let me put my phone on the ESPN app. I'm, I can handle any of that, any of it. I don't care what it is, and so many other apps. Like to the young, we got a lot of young heads on here because 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 we got we got pre-service teachers on here, so you know what the Breakfast Club is, right? That's what the young people listen to. But guess what? So do I. I listen to Charlemagne the God and DJ Envy and Angela Yee all the time. Not because I'm a fan of what of their content, all that hip hop music and gossip and all that kind of stuff. I listen to it because I'm an educator. And I have to stay connected to the children, the young people, I should say, right? The people who are the recipients of the information I convey to adults. So if I stop knowing pop culture, then when I stand before children, because I still do assemblies, I'm not relevant anymore because I don't know their world. I have to know their world. And I get a lot of their world by listening to The Breakfast Club. I listen to all those long interviews because it keeps me informed. Right. I don't like watching shows like like the BET Awards and all that. But guess what? I watch it I, because I, I got to know. I got to know what the young people are watching. I got to know their world. So I got to know their media. I got to know their music. I got to know. The, I got to know the streets. Right. So now. I, I can handle that, though, through the ear, because it's not because there's nothing complicated about. It, right. It's just I listen to it. So when I ended that article that day, I was so frustrated because I really wanted to listen to that but I could, my brain 
wouldn't process it because I didn't have opportunities to pause and process because it's just coming at you, coming at you. You know, I'm walking, I don't have time to be playing with my phone. So it's just coming at you, coming at you. It's coming and it's coming at a very rapid pace. My brain can't process that. But watch this teacher, because we're talking equity this morning. What if I'm in your classroom and I happen to be a black male? And what if I'm in your classroom and that's how instruction is coming at me? And I'm failing your quizzes. I'm failing your examinations. I'm failing your test. I'm failing standardized assessments. I'm failing everything. And, and you all think that there's something wrong, man. Principal Kefele needs to be evaluated by the, by, 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 by the uh, uh, child, child study team, right? And, 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 and see, no, no, he doesn't need to be. Teacher needs to discover that Principal Kefele is very bright, but he doesn't learn through his ear because he's highly visual. And, might, and one might even add to that, that he's also very kinesthetic, which, which I didn't know that. I didn't realize that until I became a principal. If I have time, I'll explain what that means later on. I, I had no idea until I became a principal. I said, oh my God, that's how I got through college. But I couldn't put a, I couldn't put a label on it. But I, again, I'll explain that later. I'm saying all that to say this. Hey, teacher. In fact, let's go back to the teacher from the other night who was a white woman who's teaching in a school with black children. Hey, teacher, of course you can be successful with those children. Of course you can be highly successful with those children on the one hand because others have done it. But on the other hand, it all boils down to your commitment to being great in that classroom and knowing everything you need to know in that classroom, which is inclusive of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'll add the word race and ethnicity and culture. They matter. So let's 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 go. Let's jump into some things here. So equitable classroom practices require an equity mindset teacher. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't know and I don't really care, but as far as I'm concerned, I coined that term because I, I, I'd never, particularly when I gave it a definition, because I, 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 I've never seen any other definition for it outside of the one that I wrote. And, and I thought about just all the components of being that equitable teacher, instructor, within that classroom to ensure that youngsters are in an equity mindset classroom. So, so the first question becomes, well, what is an equity mindset teacher? What, what does that mean, right? And I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought about it, I started writing about it, blogs and so forth, and then I went on and, and wrote a book about it. And the book centers around this definition, which is a little lengthy, I remember when I showed it to my wife and she said to me, why such a long definition? And I said, because I needed it to be comprehensive. Just one long sentence, one long thought, as opposed to something short where I got to add other sentences. Let me read it to you, although I know you can read it for yourself. An equity mindset teacher is a teacher who utilizes a variety of developmentally appropriate instructional strategies that consider the differing academic, social, and emotional needs of each, you see that word each, each of the learners in a student-centered, this, this classroom is all about children, culturally responsive. This classroom we take into consideration everybody, culturally relevant, this classroom, we make sure that the youngster sees self on the page, in the book, in the lesson. Barrier free, no walls to keep the youngster from learning. Equity mindset classroom, we're all, the teacher and the students, we're all thinking equity. Where student individuality, everybody's represented there as, as, a, as, as a separate individual. Student cultural identity. We're not, we're not colorblind nor culture blind in that environment. 
and student voice matter exponentially. It was interesting, uh, last night, a good friend of mine, a young lady I hired as a math teacher back in, um, I would say 99, 2000, somewhere there about, um, I left the school eventually and I brought her with me to another district. And I eventually left and she stayed and went on and did her thing, ultimately, ultimately became a superintendent of schools in Jersey. Um, she defended her, her dissertation last night and asked me to be on the Zoom call to watch. So I couldn't miss that. I had, a fl I had my flight here, but I say, I can't miss this. So I, I was able to, to watch it right before I got on the, well, before I got on the plane and while I was on the plane. So they opened up the floor to the committee to ask her questions. And I've, I've watched um, the dissertation defenses before, but I never saw one where the, 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 the community, the people, the audience could ask a question. You know, I've never, I've just never experienced that before. Maybe others have. So when they said anybody in the audience want to ask a question, man, I unmuted myself so fast, man. I was sitting on that plane and um, we hadn't taken off yet. And I said to her, because her, her topic was, was, was um, literacy and African-American education. Um, and I said to her, so she was you know, just explaining, explaining, explaining. And I said, what about, I said, what, how would you handle the pushback? And this is in the context of what I said, student cultural identity on the bottom of the screen. I said, how would you handle the pushback of a teacher or teachers who happen to be colorblind and culture blind, right? And I said to myself, man, I hope I didn't put her on the spot with that when she's defending her dissertation, right? But she, but she handled it, right? Because she said that, she said, I'm glad you asked that question, right? Because because it's an issue where you have teachers in various different classrooms in America who will say, Principal Kefele, and you know, when, when I'm in a professional development session, I don't, I don't see black children, white children, Latino children or Hispanic children, Asian children, Native American children. I don't, I don't see that. Or they may say it to me very passionately. I, I, I don't see black children, white children, uh, um, um, uh, Latinx children, Hispanic, you know what, I don't see that. I just see the children. And just thinking about that hour or so that she defended that dissertation and all that content, there's no way in the world that a teacher could be in a classroom culture blind and colorblind and thinking that the one size fits all approach is going to connect with every learner in that classroom. It's not going to happen. Because on the one hand, there are individual considerations, which is why I say student individuality, but there are student cultural identity considerations that have to be considered as well. So if a teacher has a mindset, oh man, I'm look, you know, I'm I, I, I don't see that. You know, like I mean, it sounds noble on 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 paper. I don't I don't see racial differences. I don't see ethnic differences. I don't see um, um, cultural differences. I I just see the children. But as I always say to teachers, because because ma many teachers say this to me. I say, teacher, I, I hear you, because I'm always respectful and professional, always. I hear you, but teacher, when your children go outside to go home at dismissal time, whether they be elementary, middle, high school, whatever it is, they're stepping out into a world that is very much unlike the world you've created in your classroom. Your classroom is not preparing them for that world and how to navigate it. Your classroom is preparing them for a world that's utopian, that doesn't exist. And, 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 and quite frankly, I use, when I say student cultural identity, I put a lot of emphasis on that word identity. I don't want to suppress that because one's racial makeup one's ethnic makeup, one's cultural makeup is a part of their identity. I step out into the world every day as a black man. 
not as a generic man. I'm proud of what I am. I'm proud of who I am, but there are consequences that come with who I am. So I have to be prepared for that. I have to anticipate it before it even happens, right? So I don't wanna suppress that. I wanna accentuate that. I want to illuminate that. I wanna celebrate that. So student cultural identity matters. But then there's a, there are a couple other ways to look at that. I'll do that on the next page. And then that last one says student voice. Student voice matters exponentially. I'll get into why I have the parentheses, I mean the quotations around the word voice in a little while. Let me, I see there's my chat thing is lit up. Let me see if I got something here that I need to need to read here. Um, Dana said, maybe that was Dana's name. I'll hand up there too. It boils down to humbling oneself that those students who have different background than you have a more have more to teach you than you have to teach them. Stay in, stay in a state of teach me more about your culture. I, I, you know, Dana, I, I couldn't have said it better. See, for, for, those, for, for the rest of us in this, this audience here, it's, it's, it's mutual teaching. See, I, I mean, we, we can go as far back as pre-K. That pre-K student of color that may be in a classroom with, with a teacher that is not of color, that pre-K teacher, student is teaching. The, te the, the student doesn't, that three-year-old is teaching, may not know it, but that three-year-old is teaching. That first grade is teaching. That fifth grader is teaching. That, that eighth grader, that sophomore, they're teaching. But does the teacher have the ear to hear and the eyes to see and the spirit to internalize? See, see there, there, there's teaching going on because you're learning. See. Dana, you shouldn't have said that, man. You, you know, you took me, you took me, you just took me somewhere. Let me, let me, let me say that. I'm gonna stay on point though. I went to see this movie, Black Panther. Y'all remember that movie? That was one of the biggest selling movies ever. The problem with me with the movie, I'm not into Marvel comics. Like, like that just does not float my boat. Right? So I saw the movie twice. I don't, I still, I don't know what that movie was about. And now this has nothing to do with the auditory. Though. I'm not into that. That's not my thing. But I went to see it twice. I didn't go see it twice so that I could see the second time and, and learn what I didn't learn the first time. I went to see Blacks. I, I went to be, see the movie Black Panther because I wanted to study the audience. I know that might sound weird to somebody. It might not to Dana though. But I went to, I went to see Black Panther because I wanted to study the audience. So what did I do? I went to see Black Panther in a theater that was a Black audience. And then I went to see Black Panther in a theater of a white audience. That's what I did. So when I went to see it in the theater, in the white community, I was the only Black person in the room. So I went there because I, I wanted to study the differences in, in, the, in the reaction of the audience to the movie. Because you know, movies, movie theaters are 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 a dying breed. Now. You know that they're dinosaur. You know, if, if you go to see some big time hit movie, if it's ten people in the theater, the, the theater did well, right? Nobody, you know, nobody goes there anymore. I went to see um, a Respect, Aretha Franklin, recently. Me and my wife were the only two people in the theater, and the movie was brand new. Just us. We had a whole theater to ourselves, right? So, so here, I knew I knew Black Panther was going to draw the masses. And it did. So I went to the theater, black audience, and it was what I expected. And it was vocal in there. It was vocal. It, it, was, it was a lot of chatter in that theater. And that's not a criticism, nor a mockery. Because I knew I knew going in, because of the type of movie it was, you know, you got you got black people being portrayed positively, you got black women who had offered a different uh, standard of beauty as opposed to the pop culture standard, right? So you, you, so, so you, you got dark skinned women, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's with, with, with no hair, but yet still considered beautiful, right? Or bald, it, I mean, it just, it defied all the stereotypes of what beauty is, right? So there was a lot of excitement around that. And then, and then the, the, the intelligence, 
that was exhibited of, of, of black men and women, but, it, but in this regard, black women, right? Just, just all the stereotypes gone. So people were excited about that. So now, and then the storyline for people who are into that kind of content. So people were literally talking to the screen, the whole, the whole movie. It was reminiscent of being in the in the Black Baptist or Pentecostal church call and response. And I felt, I mean, I felt really good in that theater. I felt really at home in that theater, right? The culture just manifested throughout the movie. One might say from the outside looking in, it doesn't understand the culture, but if, they, if all that talking is occurring, how are they comprehending? Well, see, that's the culture. Can, can actually do that and still comprehend what's going on. But then I went about a day or so later to a, a, a white community with a white audience. And I walked up in there, man, I said, all right, it's a different place now. That whole time that movie was playing, it was like this in the room, watch this. Two hours of silence. Now I'm not criticizing, nor making mockery. I'm just sharing an observation, culturally. I only went there for that reason too. Culturally, the experience of watching the same movie was vastly different. One group had white skin, the other group had black skin. The experience was vastly different. Well, as I watched that and, you know, I went in, you know, I had my own agenda in doing that. I said, this has school implications. This has school implications. As teacher, do I understand culturally who my children are? If, if you know, a, a, a someone who did not come, who, who is not a product of the black community, right? Or, 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 or a community other than their own. If the guys I grew up with walked into this room right now, I'm like in here by myself, but, but the guys I grew up with, they know I do this work, but I don't think any of my good friends I grew up with who are not necessarily people I'm around a lot today, I mean, you know, most of my time is like in airplanes, right? But if they walked into this room right now, I know, because I, you know, we still communicate. We're just not hanging out. I know they would be hard pressed not to start laughing at me, right? It, it, I know it would be a challenge for them to walk in here and have straight face looking at me. Let me explain why. Because back in them old days, we used to call it. I'm gonna use the old school language: cracking jokes on one another, which includes cracking jokes on some on each other's mothers. We won't do that now. But the joke part, that ain't going nowhere. That's what we did. As when we were in them elementary schools, the middle schools and high schools, that's what we did. Cafeteria, that's, that's, that's just, it's just, and in the neighborhood, that's just what it was. But we weren't about to fight. But a teacher or someone from that's not of the culture may not understand what they're seeing. I remember one time the company did a video on me and, 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 and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a promotion for a DVD I had out. And one of my guys I grew up with, he saw the video online, caught me laughing and cursing and this and that. And I said, someone outside wouldn't understand that because what he was doing was showing me love. Let me say that again because somebody might have missed that. What he was doing was showing me love. And I understood that. But someone that doesn't understand that aspect of the culture wouldn't understand what he was doing. They would say, man, that's not right that, you, that you're treating Principal Kefele like that. But see, I knew it was all, it was all love. I, I, I understood that. So I'm saying all that to say, once again, student cultural identity. You may not understand. I, I wanna give you guys one more example. I gotta give you this. Cause I, and, and the only reason I'm giving you this is because, I, because I'm sitting in, in, in the city of Louisville right now. 
I, I rode past the stadium, Cardinal, what do you call it? Cardinal Stadium, right? I think that's what it's called. And the only thing in my head was this football player, Lamar Jackson. I mean, he, he was just in my, my spirit as I drove past this state. So as I'm, as I'm driving past, I thought about a, a particular behavior that he exhibited on the Baltimore Ravens this past Sunday when he did this like flip when he scored, right? And I know that old school people in terms of old school fans will not like that. But I thought about the old Negro League baseball teams when he did that flip, those of you that watch football, when he did that flip on Sunday, I thought about the old Negro League baseball team and they were very animated, right? They weren't, they weren't like the major leagues. The Negro League, in fact, one of the teams was called the Clowns. They first were called the Miami Clowns and then they moved to Indianapolis and they, they became the Indianapolis Clowns, Negro Leagues, you know, black, and, but those of you, let me educate somebody out there that may not know what I'm talking about. Black ball players weren't allowed to play in the, in, in the major leagues because they were born black. Some of the greatest baseball players to ever live, period, were confined to the Negro Leagues. Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs, but a black man by the name of Josh Gibson hit 800 in the Negro Leagues. A pitcher by the name of Satchel Page was so good that he would tell the outfield, y'all go sit in the dugout because I'm getting ready to strike out the whole side. And he did. So in other words, he's saying, I don't need outfielders because the ball's never going to get to you. And that's what he did, struck out the whole side. So some of the greatest players to ever live played in the Negro Leagues, but because they were black, they weren't allowed to play in the majors until Jackie Robinson, which at that point, it just killed the Negro Leagues because now it opened the floodgates. Now they could get all, snatch up all them great players. So here's my point. A lot of those players were very animated. Just like a Satchel Page saying, y'all go sit down. That's animated. Nobody's doing that now. So a lot of them were very animated in the way they approached the game. So when I saw Lamar Jackson do that flip and, and other players, because you, you see football all the time, you see the animation, especially when they score, especially when they get a first down, you know, that type of thing. So I said, but that's not new. That's what that's that's embedded in the culture going back to the to the early 1900s with the Negro League, which started in 1920. That's nothing new. So someone might watch sports and say, man, the black athlete sure has changed. He's he seems very anim. No. He's not changed at all. That's what it's been. See, that is what it's been. That's not the paint with a broad brush and say they're all animated that way because they're not. But to see those components or those elements within sports, that's not a new phenomenon. That's why a team was called the clowns because they used to, they used to clown around while they played and won. So I just wanted to throw that in there, right? So let, me, let me keep going. Um, Dr. Starks, do I need to give him a break or anything or just let her keep, let her keep riding? Unmute. Let's keep moving. Okay. All right, let's go. So the question becomes for the students and, and um, ask yourselves when you get into those classrooms, when you're student teaching, when you're in the classrooms as a regular teacher, do I bring an equity mindset to my instruction? Do I bring an equity approach to my instruction? To faculty, am I going hard in terms of instruction, in terms of preparation of, of pre-service teachers to, to be able to walk into a classroom with an equity mindset, with a diversity mindset, with an inclusion mindset? Is, is, is that who I am? as instructed? Am I preparing pre-service teacher for the 21st century child? You know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of conversation these days about how TikTok is being used, right? And my wife and I, I was at the gate last night, so I called her and we got into that conversation and she reminded me, she said, you know, even though 
you know, these challenges happening with TikTok. She said, that's nothing new now. She said, because those challenges were also on Instagram and, and Facebook and so forth. She says, yes, and now this is, the, this is the flavor of the month. Everybody's using TikTok now. But then when I talk to teachers and administrators, I say, remember, like, 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 you know, this is not the, um, the age of, um, of, of Atari and, 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 and some of those older games and devices, you know, Pac-Man, the, the, the arcade, Game Boy, right? So remember the little device called Game Boy, right? This is not, we're not in the Game Boy era. The Game Boy era was a different youngster. We in the TikTok era now, right? That's, that's a different youngster now. And the question is, am I being prepared for the TikTok youngster? Or am I being prepared for the Game Boy youngster that's not in those classrooms anymore? See, sometimes we're using methodology or strategy that's not consistent with today. And that's why, as it relates to children, that I listen to the media of the young people. Now, I'm not in the classroom teaching. I'm not even leading a school, but I still work with educators. So I feel compelled to stay on top of what children know, what children are into, what children are about. So, so when I'm with out a school, I talked to a school yesterday for two hours, um, virtual, and I never got to my content. Because I said to them, I said, you know something? I'm learning that across America, every state I speak in since um, school began in August, whether it be virtual or, on, or in person, or the various different Facebook, Facebook educate, educator groups I belong to, there are two words that are salient that stand out, exhaustion and frustration, right? Teachers across America are exhausted. Teachers across America are frustrated. And, and, and when I opened up them floodgates yesterday, when I first went on at one o'clock, we were doing a one to three, them teachers didn't let me get off of that topic. They said, Principal Cafele, we tired. School just started. We tired. We're frustrated. This is different. Students are back for the first time. This is different. Let me share with you some, just a little something, something that they said. One teacher said, Principal Cafele, rest and sleep will not resolve this, this exhaustion. This is a different kind of tired. They said, the teacher said, I wake up tired. And the rest of the teachers unmuted and said, that's right, me too. They said, sitting down, just doing nothing. They, they said, this is something very different. And they're saying, because the children, see the children have been, had, as you know, have been adversely impacted by being home. See, so I won't get into a discussion on learning loss because that's not my thing, that language. But I will say this. There's so many children who sat at home with cameras off and no assurance that the youngster was even in the room. Matter of fact, I could go as far as to say no assurance that the youngster was even in the house. Because as, 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 as school districts, as school communities, as, school, as, as classroom teachers, whomever we wanna point the finger, we allowed those cameras to be off. There was a whole lot of debate going on across the country about imposing and infringing on folks' rights of privacy and all this kind of stuff. And, I, and here's, let me tell you the position I took. If, if, if school districts found all this money to provide all these children that previously had no laptop, and no connectivity and all of a sudden money popped up and now we got laptops and connectivity to all these folks. I said, well, guess what? Then there's enough money to get off of Google Meet and to get onto Zoom so that you can put a virtual background on that, on, on, on that screen. And that way all their privacy issues are gone, right? If, we, if, if parent didn't want child, um, the, the, the peers and the teacher to see the home, I, I, I get that. I don't know if I'd want them to see mine either, right? Although because I film from home every Saturday, the world knows what my dining room area looks like. So, but, but, but the thing about it is a virtual background or a blurred back background, problems are solved. I need cameras on. I gotta be able to look at youngsters. 
I don't just want to see, I mean, hear youngster. I want to look at youngster. So when I could see youngster, now I can gauge whether or not youngster is comprehending. When I speak to school staffs, the teachers don't want their cameras on. But I tell the principal, look, I'm not even speak. Look, I don't, I don't, I'm not doing this presentation if your if your staff keep the cameras off. Find another speaker. That's what I do. I hope it doesn't sound arrogant. I'm just being upfront because I need to see my audience. So I say to the principal, look, you 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 contracted with me to come in here for four hours virtually, and I'm gonna speak for four hours to a group I don't see. Oh no. Let me give you some email addresses of some of my colleagues who, who wouldn't mind talking to a blank screen. I need to see your staff. If we can't make that happen, I, I can't be the speaker today, right? Give that money to somebody else, right? So I'm, so, so I'm saying that to say, when, we, when, we, when we're really serious about equity, we gotta be able to see who we are talking to because we gotta be able to read them. You know, they call that reading the room. At speaker world, we call it audience analysis. Let me keep moving. So there's a question on the screen. And, and the question's in quotations because it's a youngster speaking. In fact, let me, let me, let me, y'all, y'all give me a timeout. I gotta take this jacket off, y'all. Time out. I'm working myself into a sweat. All right, here we go. We good. In fact, so, we're going to ask the audience to turn on their screens um, as. Um, no, I'm good. With, I'm good. I'm good. No, I, I, because this, because see now, I'm good. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so now, because um, we we just a two hour presentation, so I can I can handle. So, 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 the quotation, the quote says, "Am I somebody in my classroom?" And you'll recall a little while ago, I was talking about. In, in, in the world of equity, that there's so many different perspectives. There, there's, there's not like that universal language. Um, you know, diff, people have seen it different, different ways to, through different lenses, different experiences, et cetera, different research, et cetera. But for me, I said, I, I can handle that. However, I got non-negotiables. And, and that's just because of my, long, my longevity, my 30 years as an equity practitioner, I have, um, I have non-negotiables and they're very simple. There are three, which I already shared with you in a different context. Let me give them to you again. Number one, student individuality. As that youngster sits in that classroom, is that youngster visible? And that in that youngster's individuality manifest and it is taken seriously? Or is that youngster sitting in that classroom invisible? Does that youngster have visibility? Or does that youngster have invisibility? See, that youngster, in terms of the totality of the youngster, because the youngster can never be confined to who you see sitting at the desk, in the chair, because there's so much more to that youngster. That youngster has his or her own set of experiences, reality, challenges, obstacles, needs, interests, pressures, demands, goals, aspirations, his or her own way of learning, thinking, making sense out of information, processing information, has his or her own way of being motivated, captivated, and inspired. So there's so much to the youngster that I can't be blended and molded together and we're just this one monolithic group. I have my individuality has to matter. Am I somebody? Number two, student cultural identity. And I told you on the one hand, when I've mentioned that before, that youngster has to be able to navigate the world. But I got two more just broad responses I would give to a teacher that said to me, I don't see race, ethnicity, and, 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 um, and culture, I just see the student. I said, well, in addition to the fact that you're not preparing the youngster for the real world, teacher, by you taking that position is equivalent to the student saying without saying. Teacher, if you don't see my race, ethnicity, or culture, you don't see me. And if you don't see me, you cannot effectively teach me. And if you cannot effectively teach me, then why am I in this classroom 
in the first place. See, so in other words, that cultural identity is a part of the overall identity. See, it's part of the overall identity. You and I can't run away from that. But thirdly, I'm saying teacher, because of the various identities, youngsters stand on some very broad shoulders of people who look like them. We can't deny that, we cannot suppress that. We have to accentuate it. But the dilemma, the challenge is teacher cannot teach what teacher does not know. If it's not in the curriculum and I don't have a knowledge base of it, then it becomes very difficult for me to teach it, right? So, so let me let me let, let me let me give you this example, um, I, and I'm running a risk of giving you this example because I'm cutting into time. Well, we still got 45 minutes. Let me let me let me give you this. Right now, this thing called critical race theory is raging, y'all. It's 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 raging across America, and it's folks that are like just just so intent on banning something that I'm convinced they don't know what they're banning. Or they know what they're banning, but they're, but they're taking the, the, the real issue and folding it into this thing called critical race theory. Let, now, let me explain what I just said. I wanna give you this historical example. Back in 1900, I really love this historical example. I've been sharing this a lot for the past couple of months, I think. Back in 1900, Booker T. Washington, you all know that name, president of Tuskegee. He said, I need to bring together black business people, black entrepreneurs, black uh, future business people. He said, I need to bring them together under one roof because 1900, let me ask this question. Um, I want somebody to drop this in the chat. I want to see who you, I want to see who's out here. Let me get that chat up. Drop this in the chat. What happened significant in America? And I got that chat open right now. What happened significant in America four years before 1900? Now, I've been asking this question to my audiences for, and please don't Google this. If you don't know, just leave it, right? Don't, please don't Google it. Um, I've been asking this question all over this country. And for the first time, it, on Monday when I was in Canton, no, no, no. Yeah, for the, no, no, it wasn't Canton. When I was in Los Angeles a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, for the first time, somebody in that audience gave me my answer. But he wasn't a teacher, he was a board president. So Claudia said, Plessy versus Ferguson. I appreciate that, Claudia. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which was a landmark Supreme Court decision that made segregation legal. So four years, so, so now therefore, legally, black people have no access to anything. Jobs are not gonna happen, not, 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 not well-paying jobs and, 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 and not jobs beyond menial jobs. They're not gonna happen. So Booker T. Washington says, We've got to figure this out. I want you all to hear me on this now. We got to figure this out. So he brings all these business people together and he creates the National Negro Business League, 1900. And they strategize, how are we going to survive black people? How are we going to grow black people economically speaking? We must create businesses to self-sustain ourselves. And if you know Booker T. Washington, you know that that's what Booker T. Washington was all about, industrial and agricultural education. So now those business people go back into their respective communities and begin to strategize and ultimately build. Well, guess what? A, a contingent of that group was from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they went into Tulsa, back home to Tulsa, and by 1906, established the first business. And from there, many more, many more, many more until up until the massacre in 1921, 
there were over 200 businesses. The dollar never ever had to leave the community because everything they needed was in the community, the Greenwood section of Tulsa. So all their needs were there. Now, I don't have to go into the massacre because that's not the point that I'm raising here. Here's my point. I just dropped on you some history. Perhaps somebody out there, I gave you something new that you didn't know. I could, and you see how I said that, I could frame it as African-American history. However, I refuse. That's right. I refuse to frame that as African-American history. Instead, I frame, I'm framing it as American history that most of us have never been exposed to. And as, and as quiet as it kept, I said, I won't get into the massacre, but people in, people in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, they just starting to learn about that massacre 100 years later. Because when, 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 when it became mainstream in, in the summer of 2020, that it, that it happened, I started writing about it on social media. And people started inboxing me from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Black people from Tulsa, Oklahoma started inboxing me saying, Principal Kefele, I went, I grew up in Tulsa. I'm a product of Tulsa public schools. I never heard of Black Wall Street. That floored me. I thought, I thought a re I thought the rest of America didn't know, but I thought certainly Tulsa residents knew. They said, nah, nah. Because the 300 lives were buried in the ground and built them over, no one knows where those bodies are. They still have not recovered those bodies, over 300 deaths since 1921. So my, but, but that's not my point here. Here's my point, that history I just told you. Somebody in America will say that Principal Kefele just dove into some critical race theory. No, I didn't. Principal Kefele just dove into a little smidgen of American history that didn't make it into curriculum and instruction. A very critical piece of American history that should be in curriculum and instruction. But I have to mention the race of the people because just, because see, just by mentioning that black business people, that in itself, could be shocking for some because we're talking about just a few short years after the Civil War. And yes, there were black business people, black entrepreneurs, but came together collectively to sustain a people. You can't talk about that without talking about the racial makeup of the people in question and why the need to do that. That's not race theory, that's, his, that's American history. And, and for the, and for the anti-critical race theory crowd, it's just unfortunate for you that we have to talk about the fact that the people were black and they were denied opportunity because legally they were segregated, legally, right? So I just wanna drive that home under the equity umbrella because now I'm in a realm of culturally relevant pedagogy. But I'm also in a realm of social justice education. See, so all that fits under that umbrella. But here's the thing. If you were to go to my Twitter page right now, like Twitter gives you a, about a few characters to write a, a, a bio, a short biography, like one sentence. My bio on, on, on Twitter, let me, read, let me state it to you. you know, it's, it's memorized. I don't have to read it to you. It's not even a bio. It's a sentence. It says, let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's my bio on Twitter. Let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So in other words, it's the discomfort that brings about change. It's discomfort that brings about progress. We can't grow and get better if we always comfortable. We have to, be, we have to get to a place where we can be and feel uncomfortable. So let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable and let's get uncomfortable with being comfortable. 
Twitter only gives you a certain number. I can't, I can't add, let's get uncomfortable with being comfortable because they won't give me enough characters, right? So I got to keep it as, the, as, the, as, the, as part A. Let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So, but I'm saying that's got to drive us. Can't, can't, can't be an educator at a high level and you're not willing to roll up your sleeves like I just did. You got to be willing to roll up your sleeves and, and get, get, get deep into the mud and have the tough conversation and then come out of that as allies. So that student cultural identity, it matters. But then the third one, student voice. Student voice. I'm you, is it distinct or is it obscure? I put the word voice in quotations for this reason. I'm looking at voice two ways. First, I'm looking at the literal. Does my voice, first, do I have a voice in my classroom? And if, and, and if I have a voice, does my voice matter? Like, like my ideas, my, uh, my, my opinions, my views, my beliefs, my, my values, my vantage point, my perspective. Does my voice matter in my classroom or, or is it always suppressed? right, to the point of obscurity. Like, can I, do, do I have a platform? Can I speak with the other students? Or, or, or is, is my voice the unpopular voice? And therefore it's, it's suppressed. Because see, if I have no voice, if my voice doesn't matter, I don't matter. Because my voice is just the spoken word of who I am. I don't matter in my classroom. See, but I use voice in quotes because I got another way of looking at it. Finding one's voice. See, in other words, it's a whole lot of young people who graduate from high school. They even graduate from college and still haven't found their voice. So, so they, go to, they, they graduate from high school, go on to college, miserable on campus because I'm in a major that I have no passion for, to use that as an example. See, when, when one finds their voice, they've simultaneously found their purpose. They've simultaneously found their true essence. See, I found my voice, I'm in it right now. Y'all see my passion on this screen, man. And it's not like I'm talking to a crowd of say 4,000, 10,000, I'm talking to a smaller group, but my passion is, I, if, if this is a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm gonna be the same guy because I'm walking in my voice. I'm walking in my purpose. I'm walking in my essence. And I don't deviate from it. You know, if I'm, if I'm pulled in this direction, nah, that's all right. If I'm pulled in this direction, nah, that's all right. I'm going to stay in my voice. It's, it's like a speaker's bureau called me the other day. They said, Kefele, you got to raise your rates, your fee. I said, why? You too low. So let me tell you something. For me to raise my fee will remove me from my voice. Because, because, because I can't justify in my soul to charge somebody what you're asking me to charge to speak life into a school district, into a university, into a conference, whatever it is. I, I can't charge that kind of money. I, I just charge enough to be able to make a living. He said, all right, well, you're not going to make the big bucks. I said, I'm good with that. I'll be able to look in my mirror. But the reason I'm good, folks, want you to hear me is because of that word voice. I'm walking in my voice. I found my voice and my voice doesn't allow me to go here and here. It keeps me grounded right here. I hope you hear me. So now let's transfer that to the school. I'm talking about, have you, are, you, do you, are you putting systems in place? Faculty this one here this morning, are there systems in place when you work with pre-service teachers? Are there structures in place that help the pre-service teacher to in turn help the student to find his or her voice? There's crap happening in the streets of America. There's apathy happening in the streets of America. 
That school I talked to yesterday, which I was going to say to you when I sidetracked myself, I'm back where I needed to be with them. They said to me, large percentages of the students are coming into the building. This is a middle school in the Southeast. I won't tell you what state. And they're saying, the students are saying to them every day, we hate school. We don't want to be here. These are black children. See, so, so when, when I hear that, it makes me think of voice. Youngster hasn't, is not within a structure to find my voice, meaning that I need what my teachers are giving me to grow my voice, to nurture my voice, to, to cultivate my voice, to develop my voice. But in, in the mind of that youngster, I hate school. I don't want to be here. I want to be home. Now watch this. I want to be home the way it was last year. But the teachers told me, they already discerned that home did not mean learning was occurring. Home meant I was hiding behind a closed camera. What's going to become of those youngsters? See, That's why I said voice is an equity non-negotiable for me. Notice on here, I don't have math and science, language arts and social studies as a non-negotiable. I got individuality as a non-negotiable. I got cultural identity as a non-negotiable. I got voice as a non-negotiable. And if these three things are happening, then the math, science, social studies and language arts will take care of itself. But if I don't have that individuality, if I don't have that cultural identity that manifests, that I understand, because see, I ain't gonna get political, y'all. But in them states across the country where, 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 where with, with this critical race theory, something that I've never talked about in my life until 2021, and, and now the lines get blurred in terms of talking history that has traditionally been marginalized, trivialized, caricaturized, distorted, or omitted. Now there's teachers with this confusion because they share it with me every day. Kafele, I hear you, but I, I don't want to touch anything like that because I could lose my license. I could lose pain. I can be penalized. So now you've got confusion. But then there's a piece of my brain that says, Maybe that's the plan, right? So, 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 so I gotta, you know, so that's why I give examples in history. You know, I could give you more examples, but I'm not gonna give you any because of time. But I gave you that one example with the, uh, with the National Negro Business League to say that, no, we're not talking about nothing theory. We're talking history, right? History, that's what we're talking about. History, period. Make, making sure that all the students are represented in curriculum. And I might say interdisciplinary, not just history, represented in math, represented in science, represented in social studies, represented in foreign language, represented in C, uh, uh, CTE, right? Uh, uh, career technical education, what, whatever we're talking about, that everybody's represented. That's what I mean by student voice, right? So let's keep moving. So my equity blueprint, as I always say, everything that we do in life requires a plan. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, there are school districts in America or schools where either the superintendent or the principal has taken the position that we don't need lesson plan. My teachers are good. My teachers are great. We don't, we don't, we don't need lesson planning for the teachers. They are, we, I, I trust them. I know that they're going to take care of business. You know, those, um, th those, those leaders exist out here. And, and when I hear that, I'm, I cringe. I'm like, oh my God, you can't be serious. You, you, you have that much faith in, a, in, a, in, a, in another human being that they don't need to plan their effectiveness for their effectiveness in the classroom. You got diversity and it's 25 different youngsters in the classroom. You got diversity in the classroom, but the teacher doesn't need to plan for that. Just go in there and start teaching. No. 
but 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 the thing is, then I look at the test data. I've never I've never heard a leader of a high performing district or a high performing school say that my teachers don't need to plan. It's usually somewhere where we're already low performing. So now that now so now that leader says, oh, we don't need to plan. No, you do. Let me show you your data. <laughs> your data says you need to plan, right? And quite frankly, when I said high performing district, there are no districts of black children that are high performing. They don't exist. There are pockets of schools in districts where black children are high performing. But when we talk, when we when we include the entire school district, that doesn't exist yet. We're still, we're still, we're still waiting for that breakthrough to occur. Right. But there are, as you know, because they're, they're, they're right here in, in this county, schools who are doing phenomenally well. But that has to be replicated. So it's not just pockets of schools, it's 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 this district wide that we're getting these results, regardless of the socioeconomics, regardless of the challenges. That when they walk into this children, into, into this building, the mindset is these children are going to soar because they are attending this school and they're students of this teacher. So with that, there's got to be some planning. So I talk about with equity, planning for equity. I call this my equity. Equity blueprint, me, my meaning you, not me, right? So, I, so, so here's what I want you to do. I don't know who's taking notes, but I want you to, I want you to take notes on this one. I mean, of course, you can just take a, a photocopy of the screen, either way. But, but, but get this information here because this is, a, this is, a, this is important stuff here. Planning. So, my equity blueprint. The blueprint is broken up into four, four phases. The first being what I call the situation analysis. The situation analysis. And it asked, the situation analysis asked the question, where am I now? So even as a, as a pre-service instructor, where are you right now? Right, like, like in, in terms of who you want to become as an equity practitioner. Where are you now? What do you know? Like as you've listened to me, as you've listened to others, as, you, as you've read others, how do you see yourself? Situation analysis. So with that, there are these three areas that come under the situation analysis. Number one, areas where, let me move this out of my way, areas where I want to continue to grow, my wings. And areas where I want to continue to grow is a politically correct way of saying areas where I'm proficient. I don't like that language of areas where I'm proficient because it may lead one to not, not seek out improvement because I feel like I'm proficient here. So, I, so instead of wording it that way, I call it areas where I want to continue to grow. But I remind the person, these are areas where I'm good, my wins. And, and, and so, so, so you would think about, okay, where, what, what are some of the areas where I am good? So the faculty that's watching, as it relates to teaching equity, what are areas where I think I'm, 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 I'm coming through, I'm getting through to, to my students where they're really understanding, they're really comprehending what this whole equity thing is all about. Areas where I want to, so areas where you're proficient, areas where you could want to continue to grow, your wins, but I don't want to word it as proficient. And then whatever those are, you would list them. Number one, as bullet points, I'm good in this regard. Number two, I'm good in this regard. And, 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 and so let me go back because I hit it too many times. So it could be a list of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever it is, just listing those areas where I feel I'm proficient. If it's a teacher and that teacher's in the classroom, listing those areas where, okay, yeah, I'm good doing this, I'm good doing that, I'm good doing this as it relates to equity. And of course, this plan is transferable to literally anything in life. And you, you name it, it's transferable to anything, not just equity. So areas where I want to continue to grow, letter B, areas where I need to improve my deficiencies. So now there's certain areas where, let's start with faculty, that you said, man, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel like they're getting it the way they should get it. They're getting it in terms of passing a test or an exam, but they're not getting it in terms of internalizing. I, 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 need, I, need, to, I need to tweak this. I need to tweak my approach or the teacher. Yeah, I've got areas where I'm strong, but I've also got some areas where I'm, 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 I'm deficient. I've got weaknesses. I need, to go, I need to grow here. So then one would list them. Number one, what, what, what is that area? 
Number two, what is that area? And, and then three and four and five and six and whatever it is, you would list those areas where I need to improve. Not just thinking what within one's mind, oh, I need to improve here, I need to improve there, because it may not stay there. See, when you write it, and there's something about writing that allows you to process differently than just thinking things out. So you're writing it down, you're making it concrete and ultimately visible. So those areas of deficiency, and then number three, letter C, areas where I need to make a pivot, a shift. In other words, as I've been saying to teachers all summer long, you know, teacher, some of those things that you were very successful in doing back in 2019, they may not fly in the 2021-22 school year. This is a different youngster. This is not the youngster of 2019. This is the, this, this is the pandemic youngster. The pandemic youngster is not the pre-pandemic youngster. The pandemic parent is not the pre-pandemic parent. The pandemic teacher is not the pre-pandemic teacher. There are some things that you may be doing that you may need to make a complete pivot, meaning shift away from and put something different in place that's consistent with the times that we are in now. What might they be? Number one, number two, you gotta list them. But see, you gotta, you gotta find that quiet time Right, let me get. I want to get something out here for you. Right? If I if I can put my hands on it, oh man, I can't find it. Here it is. This you got to get that mirror for self reflection, right? You got to find that quiet time and just you and your mirror as you look at you. What what are those areas of deficiency? What are those areas of that are obsolete? that I need to adapt to the child of 2021, the pandemic era child, because those strategies from 2019, 18, 17, some of them, they may not work anymore. You know, I, I think about, and, and some, some of you will be able to relate to this and others may not, but, but when, when people used to ask me about how we raised test scores the way we did from, being in the 20s to 100% proficiency in a short period of time. And they'd ask me all sorts of questions and they were expecting me to talk about instructional strategies and this and that. And I did, but I didn't start there. I said, you know something? It was something about when the student arrived on campus, first my guys, and it was this, right? That strong handshake, that looking into his eye, that letting him know I'm glad to see him, that letting him know I know you're gonna be extraordinary today. It was something about like, and not just this, but this, holding that youngster for a minute. Or, or that young lady, some of them young ladies used to try like turn to the side and hug me, man. So I'll hug him back, turn to the side, you know. But, but it was something about that greeting. That greeting set the stage, it set the tone, it laid the foundation for what would transpire for the rest of the day. But you know something? I share this a lot. If I was a principal right now, I lost this. I don't have this anymore. And, and, and again, someone out there, you may be able to relate to this. Others might be like, I don't get it, right? But, but, but hear me anyway. This thing mattered, but it matters if, and this is a huge if, if I matter, if I don't matter, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. But if I matter, this has substance. This was a game changer. This raised test scores. This put youngsters in college. This put youngsters in trade schools. This kept youngsters in school. This was power. Well, when I think about if I was a principal now, I don't have this anymore because we can't touch each other. At best, all I got is this. This ain't the same thing. It ain't no, I, I hope y'all can handle ain't. I'm, I, you know, I'm just using, I'm just, I use it for emphasis. This ain't no love, y'all. Ain't no love in this. This just a pandemic greeting. 
He love right here. I would have to figure out a way to still convey the same power, the same love, but I can't go back to my 2019 strategy because that's not going to work. Let me give you another one. Here was my part B before the classroom. I used to do morning convocation. I bring my whole school together in the gym and give them a message. It's like being in the congregation. Pastor, I deliver a message. Now we go to class. It's like the head coach at the Cardinal Stadium. They don't, they don't have the, 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 the student athletes put on the uniform and then they just walk leisurely out onto the field. The head coach got the final say. Now we march out onto the field as one. Well, I, that's how I did it. I led that convocation, y'all. That message. Now we ready to get down with teaching and learning. Well, guess what? I can't bring no whole school and no gym no more. That's including with masks. That's over. I would have to pivot. I would have to find something different to do to still bring about the same results. I would have to make a shift. Well, that's where your list comes in. You got to list what are those things that you're going to have to do differently. Let's keep it moving. That's the situation analysis. Number two, Roman numeral two, the goals. Where am I going? And now you go back, letter A. You see up, up top with the situation analysis, it says areas where I want to continue to grow, my wins. Now you write that same sentence again. Areas where I want to continue to grow, but based on those bullet points, you wrote one, two, three, four, five. Now you do a A1, A2, A3 under goals, and you write, what's your goal as it relates to your current situation? And that's that's that current situation is so important because you just can't move forward until you've really identified, discerned, detected, investigated, explored where you currently are. How are you going to set a goal, but you're not firm in where you're starting from? So now you set the goal and then you do the list. So areas where I want to continue to grow. Letter B, areas where I need to improve. So once again, you look at what you wrote for your deficiencies in the same sequence. So number one, what'd you say? Number two, what'd you say? So now you go to B1 under goals. All right, what, so, so now what's the goal that coincides with the situation analysis? B2, what's the goal that coincides with B2 under the situation analysis? B3, B4, B5, et cetera, right? Now you go down to, and, and then let us see, areas where I need to make a pivot. And then once again, C1, C2. C3, I wish I could have written the numbers out, but I don't have enough room on the screen to keep the font size large enough for people to see. So C1, C2, C3, the goal that corresponds with the situation analysis areas where I want to, where I need to make a pivot or a shift, right? And then, and, and then finally, the strategy, right? Not finally, I should say number three, the strategy. How will I get there? That's the plan. So now you go to letter A, areas where I want to continue to grow. All right, well, based on your goal, letter A, and your bullet points, what is the plan? So everything will correspond going down, right? So, so A1 course in situation analysis corresponds with A1 under goals, which corresponds with A1 under strategy, right? So now you would go on and what's your plan? And that might be more than a bullet point. You might have, you might want to do some a little bit more writing there because you're writing a plan. So A1, A2, A3. Then you go to letter B, areas where I need to improve, right? And then once again, B1, B2, B3, and then letter C, areas where I need to make a pivot, a shift. And then once again, C1, C2, C3, and so on, depending on how many you wrote. So that's the first part of the plan, the situation analysis, the goals, the strategy. Now you wanna go to number four, implementation. Walking in my plan. And I'm, I'm gonna put a mirror up here because I'm saying you gotta, you, you gotta stay self-reflective in this whole process. And while you're self-reflective, 
thinking about everything in your situation analysis, your goals and your strategy. Now you're being self-reflective as you implement because there are gonna be adjustments that need to be made. There are gonna be tweaks that need to be made. So you wanna make sure that you are self-reflective along the way. But, but in addition to being self-reflective, you wanna be self-assessing. So you wanna make sure that you assess yourself. You gotta evaluate yourself. You can't wait for an evaluator of record to assess you. You got to be willing to assess yourself with your mirror. So self-assessment, which leads to self-adjustment. You gotta make some shifts. You gotta make some adjustments. You gotta make some changes. You gotta make some tweaks because that document, that, that, that uh, equity blueprint is not a fixed document, it's fluid. So, you, so you're gonna be making some adjustments because, because life is unfolding in front of you. Real life, life is happening. So you gotta be able to make those adjustments in real time. And then finally, self-improvement. That's the goal always, that you wanna change, that you wanna, that you wanna get better, that you wanna improve all the way to self-actualization, you know, let, letting that always be the, 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 the big macro goal that you want to be the best version of yourself in the process, right? So, man, I got like nine minutes left. Let me talk fast. Um, got a question for you. As you prepare to go to, um, to, to become that teacher or faculty, as you're preparing pre-service individuals to become teachers, this is, a, this is a very potent question to ask. When you see the faces of your students of color, who and what do you see? Who do you see? What do you see? You know, but, but, but thinking of me, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go through these, two, these couple of slides like very quickly, so I'm gonna do a disservice, I guess, but, I, but, but just you know, so try, to, try to keep up with me because I wanna maximize these last few minutes. You know, there's, a, there's, there's about at least a half hour of, of dialogue in this slide, if, if, if we were face to face and we were dialoguing and all that kind of thing. But then, you know, I, I, I thought about it and I said, I asked the proverbial question, if I knew back then, and here's then, what I know now, and that's me at eight, year, eight years old, if I knew back then what I know now, what would I say to a teacher? And this is again, under the equity umbrella. If I knew back then what I know now, what would I say to a teacher? And I usually spend probably about a good 45 minutes on this screen. I'm going to race through it because I want to, I just want to get a lot in before we, we're done, before you guys got, got to leave. And, and plus we'll do a Q and A for those who, who can stick around. So I said, hey teacher, I promise to do my part throughout this year, but as my teacher, I only ask of you these five simple things. So what I want you to do these are like, these are about as simple as it gets, but there are many students across the country who are not experiencing this. So let this young eight-year-old Principal Kefele speak for the students that you will have one day. And he said, number one, very simple, doesn't get any simpler than this, believe in me. Believe in me. But he paused it and said, with everything you've got, there are young people in classrooms subjected to teachers who do not believe in their possibilities. That's real or else I wouldn't have it on the screen. I would have come up with something else. He's saying, look, I can't be proficient in anything if I'm with a teacher that doesn't believe in me because, because whether or not you believe in me will dictate who you are in relationship to me. So believe in me as an individual, student individuality with everything you've got. But then he said, get to know me. And he said, get to know me beyond who I am in my classroom. As I said to that teacher that came to that microphone the other night, I said, you got to venture out to that community where them, where, them, where them children of color live. And if you're afraid of that community, then you're afraid of these children. You cannot be afraid of that community. If you're going to teach those children, then you got to have the willingness to go into that neighborhood and see what, see, see, see what it is that they are a product of. That's the, that's the community that produced them. Right, so, 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 so you gotta know them beyond the fraction of them that sits in that chair. Number three, prove to me that you care about me. Don't, don't give me lip service, don't tell me you care, demonstrate that you care and that you're committed to me. Once again, student individuality. Number four, challenge me to reach my potential. 
challenge. Don't, 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 don't reward me for mediocrity. Don't reward me for average. Challenge me to be phenomenal teacher while taking the time to learn how I learn. I'm so glad I touched on that earlier because there's, there's a lot to be said about that one. While taking the time to learn how I learn. And finally, number five, he said, expose me to my history. I'm glad I took some time to talk about that one too, but I would want to elaborate. He said, because I need to know who I am. I need to know. He said, hey, teacher, am I at an advantage therefore? Because you are my teacher? But see, staying along this theme of equity, there are young people like myself. I was a good student. I was serious too. You know, that, that you see there's no smile on my face. My mother reminds me all the time to this day. She's 86. She said, you never smile. You never smile. My wife gets on my case to this day. You never smile, right? And, and, but I do smile. I smile a little bit more than I did, say, before I retired from the principalship. I, seen, I started smiling a lot once I retired from it. It's, uh, it was certain stresses that I was able to relieve myself of, right? But I miss it. But here's the thing. Life started happening for me. And life got difficult. And I just want to show you this real quick because this youngster is going to show up in your classroom. It says, when you see the face of this 18-year-old young man of color, who and what do you see? Well, this is 10 years later. He wasn't smiling either. But this youngster is going to show up in your classroom as well. And I don't mean just at, at 18. I mean, this youngster could show up in your classroom at a much younger age. Let me tell you what he said. He said, hey, teacher, I'm 18 now and I'm completely lost. So, so just for clarity, for anybody that doesn't realize that's, that's me and, and what I'm getting ready to show you is all true story. So he said, I'm completely lost. He said, I'm in my fifth year of high school with a 1.5 GPA. I didn't say fourth year. I said fifth year. And, I don't, I, and, and I'm not talking about some, some program with, with early college, and, no, 50, right? Um, I'm currently attending my fourth high school. I was, I was kicked out of my first high school. I dropped out of my second high school. I went to live with my father in my third high school. We didn't know each other, so we didn't get along. So he said, go back home to your mother, and I did. And then my mom moved us to another part of Jersey, and it didn't work. So I've lost my focus. I've lost my drive my ambition and my purpose. I don't believe in myself anymore. School has no relevance for me. I don't think there's an adult in my school who cares about my plight. And my counselor even informed me that I'd never amount to anything. His words did not phase me. So I went on and graduated in five years and for the next five years did absolutely nothing except the things that the streets will dictate, which I'm not gonna get into because we're recording and I just don't want all that out there But today. Other times I do, today I don't. So, um, so whatever your imagination says, that's what I was into. So, but here's the thing. It says, teacher, don't quit on it because who knows? Well, I went on and became a, a 12 book author, a turnaround principal, a whole lot of awards, a milk and winner, hall of fame of this and that. And, and I'm here talking to you at the University of Louisville. So I'm saying that to say this, Teacher, pre-service teacher who's watching, because you see extreme wrong end, meaning that youngster's going in the wrong direction, don't write that youngster off. Look into your mirror and ask yourself, are the strategies that I'm using, these strategies that that youngster needs in order for me to make that connection? Do I need to do something different do I need to do some different kind of reading, attend a different kind of conference, a different kind of workshop, different kind of dialogue with my peers, different kind of dialogue with my administrative record, you know, whatever it is, it, 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 enroll in, in, in some courses, you know, whatever, because I'm convinced beyond the shadow of a, shadow of a doubt that every youngster was born to do great things. But, all, but many youngsters are born into situations that are so overwhelming that many of their teachers, if asked to trade places with those youngsters for a day, would not last in their shoes for more than five minutes. Because you've got many young people 
who are living very complicated lives. And, and, it, and it has an adverse effect on school and school tends to not seem as significant as it is. That's where you and I come in. Because as he said at the bottom, hey teacher, don't quit on me because who knows, right? So I see what time it is. So I, I, I hope you guys could stick around for some Q and A, but let me at least give you a way to stay in touch with me or stay in contact with me. Um, Y'all see all them thumbnails that I didn't cover. It's, it's, it take me a week to cover all this, man. It's, it's just so much there. But, but just um, go to principalcafele.com. I don't, you know, I, I hate to call that a website because it's, 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 it's not really a website. It's a website, but I call it my Institute of Professional Learning. I got so much on there, podcasts, interviews, videos, um, um, articles that I've written, blog posts I've written, articles written about me. You know, it's just a lot there. So just go to the website and check it out. And then if, 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 I, um, if, 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 if I was of interest and met, met any of the need that's out there today, then it doesn't have to stop here. Because every Saturday morning, I'm on Facebook Live, Twitter Live, YouTube Live simultaneously. Um, live streaming what I call the virtual AP Leadership Academy. It's an academy I started primarily for the assistant principal. It was an 18 week endeavor during the height of the pandemic in, um, in 2020, but it developed national and international attention that I'm now, now going into week 74 this Saturday. I'll be in a Las Vegas hotel room, nothing stops me. So even though I'm not in my home, I still do these, they're for an hour. It's me some weeks, other times I have a guest. This week will be a guest and we're gonna be relevant to things that are happening right now in education as it relates to the exhaustion, the frustration, and still being proficient educators. So how do you get on? Nothing to register for, nothing to sign up for, no link to be sent to you. Just go to my Twitter page at Principal Cafele. You see the, the spelling on the top of the screen. You can go to my Facebook page at Principal Cafele, two words. You can't friend me, so don't send me a friend request. I'm past that maximum. Just hit the follow button, right? And you're in. Or go to my um, Facebook page called Virtual AP Leadership Academy, which you see at the top top right, and um, like and follow that page. That's, um, that's my Virtual AP page. Or you can go to my YouTube channel called Virtual AP Leadership Academy, subscribe to it, and then not only can you watch the live ones, but you can watch the previous 73. And I've got a whole lot, 73 different topics, 73 hours of footage. There's a whole lot there that you can watch and I'm sure it will be most beneficial. I mean, this is like a college course online for free. You just don't get the credits, right? But, um, but, but, but check it out. And then you see the books on the bottom. I hope that um, you guys will check out the Equity and Social Justice Education 50. And then as teachers, the Teacher 50, Closing the Attitude Gap, which I think in these times of 2021, that book has become super relevant again, which I'm gonna have to start making people aware because that's one of my older books. 2013 is when I read it, wrote it, and then motivating black males to achieve in school and in life. And then you see the video channels there right in the middle of the screen. Um, check those out. That message to your son, message to the youth. That's me talking to directly to the young people as opposed to talking to adults. There are about 225 of those videos, maybe about 230. With that said, I guess I'll turn it back over to Dr. Starks and then we'll, if we have q and I'm all ears, I'm ready to go. Hey, thank you, Principal Caffelli. And for the attendees who are still here, do you have any questions for Principal Caffelli? Please put those in the chat box or if you'd like to just ask your question, then uh, we are able to do that as well. Let's take this golden opportunity to be able to you know, ask Principal Caffelli some questions. You, you know, and while we wait, you know, Judy uh, Lipman said something that um, that I that I want to read out loud. Um, she says, "So glad, thankful for your why." So she's talking about me, mm -hmm. showing how to grow, showing how to grow for us all. So needed, not clearly expressed as mm -hmm. you do. And, mm -hmm. and let me let me let me say this to you, Judy. Um, this thing called public speaking, I want, you, I want you to hear me well. This might be the most significant thing I've said all day. This thing called public speaking, I, I, I've kind of folded that into this category that I call my craft. I take this public speaking so seriously. I eat it, I sleep it, I breathe it. 
it's it's my craft and, and it's a reflection of me and whatever success I had the proverbial yesterday, it doesn't count today, right? I, I, I gotta be good, right? I'm not patting myself on the back here. I'm making a point. I have to be effective. I have to be able to convey whatever the topic is I'm trying to convey, where folks don't feel like, oh, man, I don't know what he said. I'm confused, you know, that type of thing. And I hope I was able to do that. You kind of made me think I did. And so, so let me transfer that to all of the folks on the call today and who will see it later. What you do, faculty member, pre-service teacher, future counselor, future administrator, you know, whatever it is, you've got to be so serious about it that you said, this is not just my job. This is not just my career. This is not just my profession. This is my craft. This is my thing. This is what I do. And I got to be good at it. I got to be great at it. I got to be phenomenal at it. I got to be extraordinary at it because I'm going to hold myself accountable for being the best version of myself at it. That's how I approach being a teacher. And I guess that's why they made me the school teacher of the year, the district teacher of the year, the county teacher of the year, the New Jersey state finalist teacher of the year. And I had only been teaching for four years, right? So I guess because I took it that seriously, I ate it, I slept it, I breathed it. It was my life, right? Then as a principal, they give me all these, these awards again. Once again, I took that principalship seriously, y'all. So, so let me, I just wanted to throw that at you. I appreciate that, Judy. I just wanted to throw that at you because that's, you, you got to take it that you got to treat it like that. You can never allow yourself, man, I'm not, I promise I'm not going to start another presentation. You can never allow yourself to point fingers, right? It's, it's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. It's the community's fault. It's the media's fault. It's the music's fault. You, you can't do that. You can acknowledge it, but then you got to go to your mirror. But what can I do to overcome? those challenges that I knew were out there before I even took the job. That's how you got to approach that. Absolutely. And um, those words are, are powerful because there is a quote that says, knowing others is wisdom, but knowing yourself is enlightenment. There you go. And looking in the mirror at, at who you are as a person and what is your why, because you can't like on the airplane, they said you can't help anyone else until you put the mask on yourself first. Right. You know, and that mask becomes looking in the mirror and doing that self-reflection piece you know, to be able to know what your why is beyond your degree, beyond your title, beyond your privilege, beyond your money. Who are you as a person? What's in your heart? What's in your what's your passion? And what is your why? You know, and why with a purpose, you know, as well. That's right. Good so stuff. hey, do we have any questions from <clears throat> you know from our attendees? Uh, we want to <clears throat> thank you for being here. Pat okay, Marshall yeah. has something. I see. Yes. As a university supervisor of new teachers of all races and genders, what is, what is one activity can I do to change their content focus within the, strict, within the strict school guidelines to be most open for cultural equity? Yeah. Um... Let me, read, let, me, let me read that one more time, the process. Yes. Okay. Are you able to see it? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. <laughs> yeah, and, and see, you said strict school guidelines. You know, the, the, the one activity, you know, to keep the answer short as well, that I could think of is that in terms of your relationship with the school, there's a lot of schools that for political reasons, are not willing to have the collective uncomfortable conversation about race and other differences, you know, whether it be race, whether it be ethnicity, culture, gender, sexual orientation, privilege, whatever it is. They're not willing to have those conversations as a staff, as a collective with administration present because of political implications or, or administrators fear that I may lose some of my staff. You know, I may lose the energy. I may lose the motivation, the, the morale, you know, that type of thing. And I'm saying this, in terms of you, you know, that activity, you engaging that particular school or, or, or district, it's, it's gotta be a thing where we're, we're helping particularly leadership to have the people skills 
that are necessary to be able to engage staff without losing staff. See, I'm, you know, as, as I say all the time, I'm not the same speaker with every audience because I know like, 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 like the other day, some, I was somewhere, I don't know where I was, but someone said to me, they said, you got real strong after the lunch break. It, it, it was a, per, it was a contact person. They said, you got real, like, like I started the presentation at eight. They said, you got real strong at 1230. I said, yeah, let me tell you why because I, I, I read the room. And had I been strong at eight, I would have lost the room by 8.05. So I said, as much as I want those four hours to be strong, I, I, I read the room and I was clear on what I, what, I, what, what I perceived of the room. I said, so let me spend the morning portion winning these people over, yeah. right? I don't mean with fluff, but I mean, just not, the, not that, that tough content. So I knew by lunchtime, I said, they're mine. I got them. And I transitioned into that tough conversation and they rode that thing with me to four o'clock, right? So then I said to the person, I said, had I given them what you heard at that afternoon session in the morning, then your life would have been difficult when I left the district because now you would have been cleaning up my mess, right? I said, because they would have been fired up. They would have been mad. They would have probably said I brought in critical race theory and all that kind of stuff. I said, but because I won them over, I used my people skills to bring them to my way, to, 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 to my side. I said, now they allowed me to deliver the presentation that you wanted me to deliver and the one that I wanted to deliver. So, but see, that's people skills. And some of us in leadership, we don't have that. Right, or we forgot that and we trying to hammer people, right? Or we trying to step on people, or we trying, it's my way or the highway, and 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 we're using our title to lead instead of our influence to lead, right? So, so, but that's people skills. So I would say working with staff on developing those skills because the teachers need the same skills. Because you got some strong, you got some strong will, strong-minded people who sitting in those same faculty meetings who who, who may become a little bit too vocal, not considering who else is in the room. Because at the end of the day, we still have to be a team. We have to be one. We have to go onto that field and be ready to win that game. We can't do it splinter. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. And I've always you know, asked a question to individuals as well. You know, do you have the same passion and commitment five years in, 10 years in, 15 years in? If not, then why not? Then that becomes, like I said, that reflection piece. Yeah. Where are you? You know, what is your why? You know, is your why still there? You know, in terms of education. That's right. Yeah. So, um, do we have any other questions um, from the audience? Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Hey, and Principal Caffelli, I just want to thank you for returning to the University of Louisville uh, and also to the Louisville community, uh, whether that be teachers, you know, higher ed, K-12, you know, higher education, the community, because as you say, this is a collective effort. Uh, we need all hands on deck. This is not something that we can do alone. You know? And so we need to make sure that we are supporting each other in this work because the youngsters are saying, the kids are saying, who has our back? Yeah. Who's supporting us? Yeah. And we need to be there to allow them to have voice and be able to recognize their voice and be able to do something with their voice and not talk at them, but talk to them. Yeah. Right. And allow them to be able to talk to us, you know, be receptive to their conversation. And those things are so critical because as we saw yesterday on the news, with the three young people being killed at the bus stop, yeah. that touches all of our lives. Yeah. And, and it hurts, you know, because I'm thinking about the, the mother or the parent who allow their child to go to the bus stop to get on the bus. And 15 minutes later, that's a different conversation that's happening um, yeah. that their child has been killed or in the hospital. We, we, can be, we can have an impact in all of that because we all can do something and the spaces and places that we occupy. 
yes, we can. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So with that being said, we're going to end here because we don't have any questions um, from anyone. I think we have a comment from Rachel Klein that said, thank you for the insights and the thought compelling discussion. Well, you can see it. I appreciate your wisdom and experience. Mm -hmm. I said, I appreciate it too. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Thank you, Pat, Claudia. Mm -hmm. Mar Margaret Tan, I think, Dr. Con uh, Connell. And my goal is always to be able to be the connector, you know, of all these institutions, all these entities, because many times you don't have the opportunity to have these courageous conversations, and therein lies the problem. We have to be able to have, provide the platforms to have the courageous conversations that's needed and necessary um, at the local level, state level, and national level. We have to have these courageous conversations and be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's as right. you stated earlier. That's right. That's right. So, hey, again, a, a big thank you to everyone. We're going to end it here without any, uh, we don't have any additional questions. And we want to thank you all you know, for, for being here today as well. And being a part of the Nice Dream Speaker Series as we continue to connect with our communities. <laughs>